Laurel and Hardy, Abbott and Costello, Cheech and Chong, Jay and Silent Bob. The comedy duo is a time-tested construct in the world of entertainment. The ubiquitous formula finds its origins in the music halls of mid-19th century Great Britain, all the way across the pond to the stages of American vaudeville, and even in the Japanese tradition of manzai, dating back a thousand years or more. The double act frequently consists of a straight-laced performer and his comic foil, often a person of contrasting body type. Quick-witted wordplay, fast-paced verbal exchanges, and a bit of slapstick violence is typically employed to engage and entertain. Although few double acts made a successful transition from stage to screen in the early days of cinema, the nascent motion picture medium catapulted a number of performers to national and international stardom, and in so created the buddy movie genre. This formula would go on to be implemented in everything from straight comedies to adventure films and horror flicks, and gave rise to the wildly prolific buddy cop movie in the 1980s. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's rewind a bit, back to the 1950s. In the United States, the Western dominated both at the box office and on television. With more than 800 films and nearly 100 TV shows produced during that decade, the American Western made megastars of actors such as John Wayne and Jimmy Stewart, and directors like John Ford and Howard Hawks. Naturally, international producers wanted a piece of that pie, and while some filmmakers such as Akira Kurosawa would adapt the Western for a new audience, many Italian movie makers wanted to see their pictures play in American cineplexes alongside their Hollywood-produced cousins. Enter Italian filmmaker Sergio Leone. Tapping a young Clint Eastwood who was nearing the end of a starring tenure on the TV series Rawhide, the director-actor team almost single-handedly introduced American audiences to the so-called Spaghetti Western with their film A Fistful of Dollars in 1964. Throughout the 60s and into the 70s, more than 400 westerns were either produced or co-produced with Italian lira. But these weren't always simple knockoffs or reheated leftovers from Hollywood's hottest hits. The change in culture allowed filmmakers to do new and interesting things with their movies, whether that meant increased violence and sexuality, or even the bending and blending of the genre itself. So today, we're going to talk about what happened when the Italians took the Western and smashed it together with the buddy comedy. And of course, how that particular goulash translated into a love letter of a video game that emerged nearly 50 years later. Let's dive in. Italian actor Mario Girodi began his career young, appearing in his first film, 1951's Vacation with a Gangster, at the age of 12. Five years later, Girodi would nab his first leading role in a movie called Guaglione. The next 10 years or so would provide consistent supporting roles for the young performer, but few opportunities for superstardom, despite appearing alongside some very well-known actors such as Burt Lancaster and Alain Delon. Meanwhile, two-time Olympian Carlo Pedersoli was making the transition from a successful swimming and water polo career to one in film acting. After several years of minor and uncredited roles, Pedersoli took a break to focus on songwriting and documentary producing. But little did he know that a chance offering would change the course of his life and career forever. In 1967, eight years after Pedersoli's last screen appearance, director Giuseppe Colizzi approached the actor about participating in his next movie, a western titled God Forgives, I Don't. The plan was to pair him up with Peter Martel, a fellow Italian who had been making a name for himself in Italian and Spanish-produced westerns. One day before production began, however, Martel broke his foot and was forced to bow out of the role. Colizzi then offered the part to Mario Girodi, who happened to appear in 1959's Hannibal, which was also the last film Pedersoli was in before his acting hiatus. Colizzi asked Pedersoli and Girodi to change their names to something more American, a common practice in spaghetti westerns at the time. They gave me a list of, of you know, 20 names and said, in 24 hours you have to choose a name because we have to come out. Oh, like, it always happens, things at the last minute. So I went to this list, I said, well, I like this name, and take this one. And that's how it happened, and through a simple list. And I was lucky, be lucky in a way, because I had put in contracts that the next movie I'm going to make, because they uh, make a, 
I will go back to my original name. But the movie at that time was a success worldwide and the distributors came praying to me, please, 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 <laughs> let's forget this clause in the contract and stay with Terrence Hill. And while Girodi picked his name from a list, legend has it that Pedersoli took Bud from Budweiser Beer and Spencer from American actor Spencer Tracy. And thus began the storied partnership of Terrence Hill and Bud Spencer. The success of God Forgives I Don't led to two sequels, Ace High and Boot Hill in 1968 and 69 respectively, in which Hill and Spencer reprised their roles. Even though this trilogy of fairly straightforward westerns gave their careers a boost, it wasn't until 1970 that the duo would find their niche in the realm of comedy. Writer-director Enzo Barboni wrote a screenplay about a lazy, transient gunslinger named Trinity who helps a settlement of Mormons defend their territory against a gang of bandits and a land-hungry army major. Producer Italo Zingarelli convinced Barboni that Trinity could use a sidekick, so the character of Bambino was created as Trinity's outlaw brother, who was posing as the sheriff of a small town. Peter Martell and George Eastman were originally cast in the dual leads, but were eventually replaced by Spencer and Hill, who had become very popular after Colizzi's trilogy. This also marked the second time that Terence Hill would replace Peter Martell in a role. The film was released in 1970 under the title They Call Me Trinity and was an instant success, nearly outpacing Sergio Leone's Man With No Name trilogy at the international box office. The movie inspired knockoff films in its home country, some even going so far as to pilfer the Trinity name and cast lookalikes of Spencer and Hill in the primary roles. Of course, the movie had official sequels of its own, including 1971's Trinity Is Still My Name and 1995's Sons of Trinity, in which the leads were recast to play the children of Trinity and Bambino. The success of They Call Me Trinity and its first sequel launched Hill and Spencer's careers into the stratosphere, both as a pair and as individual leading men. Is it true that your salaries are in the millions of dollars? Well, um... Should I answer? Yeah, I guess it is. Yes, it is true. I, I can answer. We are very rich. Throughout his career, Hill continued to favor the Western as a handsome and charismatic hero figure, while Spencer branched out into other genres, never straying too far from the brutish but good-hearted tough guy character that made him famous. But despite their solo successes, Terrence Hill and Bud Spencer's best performing and most well-remembered outings are as an indomitable duo. And although the Spaghetti Western was their breakthrough, first with Colizzi's trilogy and then with Barboni's Trinity series, they wouldn't make another Western together until 1994's Troublemakers, which would be their final film appearance as a team. Fast forward 21 years to 2015, when Indie Vault, a collective of independent game developers based in Italy, organized a game jam that would run between September 18th and October 18th of that year. A game jam is an event where individuals or teams of programmers, designers, and various artists attempt to make a video game from the ground up in a very limited amount of time, even as brief as a single day or two. Certain ground rules, including restrictions on genre, design software, and operating platform, can focus this whirlwind development cycle under a unifying concept or theme. For Indie Vault's game jam, however, there was only one guideline. Make a game inspired by, hinting at, generated from, or whatever creative verb you can come up with, the great spaghetti western movies from the 60s onwards. The contest received 13 submissions ranging from point-and-click gallery shooters to reflex challenges and first-person shooters, but one entry stood out among the rest. A group of five developers calling themselves Trinity Team turned in a side-scrolling beat-em-up titled Schiaffe a Fagioli, based on Enzo Barboni's Trinity films, in which players stepped into the cowboy boots of Terence Hill's Trinity and Bud Spencer's Bambino to knock around some bad guys. The pixel art graphics and stylized presentation called back to the arcade brawlers of the 80s and 90s, and the music was instantly recognizable to anyone familiar with the films. The game took the number one spot when submissions closed on October 18th, 2015. But the story doesn't end there. Almost exactly one year later, on October 27th, 2016, Trinity Team launched the Kickstarter campaign for a full commercial version of Schiaffe e Fagioli, complete with official licensing for all aspects of the project, including likenesses, music, and more. Translating the title from Italian to English, the small studio announced their intent to make Bud Spencer and Terrence Hill Slaps and Beans, referring to two seemingly unrelated yet recurring elements in movies featuring the duo. 
Handling meeting their 130,000 euro goal plus a few stretch goals, Trinity team closed their campaign on December 11th, 2016 with 212,557 euros of crowdsourced funds in hand. Production lasted for another year and four months following the close of the Kickstarter campaign, with a few beta and early access versions becoming available to backers as early as December of 2017. But on April 20th, 2018, the full release of Slaps and Beans landed on Steam for everyone to enjoy. And although they didn't quite make their stretch goal for console versions, Trinity Team secretly went ahead and ported their game to Xbox One, PlayStation 4, and Nintendo Switch, which hit those respective digital storefronts on July 24th that year. The game even got a physical release by Strictly Limited Games in August 2019. So with that, let's jump in and see how the game plays. Right off the top, the title screen treats the player to one of the more famous songs associated with either actor, Bulldozer by Oliver Onions from Bud Spencer's solo film They Call Him Bulldozer. An opening cutscene immediately makes good on the promise of the title. Spencer and Hill slap around a gang of ruffians who ruin their dinner of beans. Hopping onto a pair of horses, our heroes ride through a cinematic title sequence featuring Trinity's theme song as performed by Franco Michelizzi. Arriving at a small western town, the duo comes up against a group of bandits who are terrorizing the citizenry. Here, the players will become more familiar with the mechanics of the game. Utilizing a fast, weak attack will quickly build up a blue gauge below the character's yellow health bar. When a section of the bar is full, a signature heavy attack can be used for extra damage. For Spencer, this is his famous hammer strike on top of an enemy's head. For Hill, the heavy attack is his well-known flurry of slaps. Both characters can perform a double hammer fist as an alternative heavy attack if the light and strong buttons are pressed simultaneously. Item pickups such as beer or a frying pan full of beans provide a health boost and a heavy attack gauge boost respectively, the empty container then usable as a melee or thrown weapon. If playing as Bud Spencer, you'll be able to pick up downed enemies and use their bodies much like any other weapon. A run ability can be coupled with a light attack for a strike with some knockback, and a block or dodge button, depending on if you're playing as Spencer or Hill, can be timed to perform a unique counterattack. These functions round out your basic abilities. Fighting their way through the town and into the saloon, the player learns that Bud and Terrence are on a covert mission from the government to locate a secret weapon. They are told that the bandits delivered a mysterious crate to the sheriff before taking control of the town. Before the end of the level, the player will be introduced to two more minigame style mechanics, the slaps burst button mashing challenge and a quick draw timing game. Learning that the sheriff has escaped, our characters head toward the train station, ending the first level. Each end stage screen gives the player a few stats about their playthrough, including clear time, number of attacks, amount of damage received, pickups acquired, and an overall point total. Level 2 begins with a scrolling dodge challenge like the Turbo Tunnel in Battletoads as our heroes chase down a moving train. Once aboard, the player must fight their way along the top of the locomotive while ducking obstacles that zoom past overhead. The duo battles their way into and back out of the train until they catch up with the sheriff. This will be your first boss encounter of the game. Simply toss back the sticks of dynamite the sheriff is lobbing at you and you'll soon see the bad guy defeated, revealing that you've been on an Old West movie set this entire time. As stage three begins, the director, who bears a passing pixelized resemblance to Enzo Barboni, tells Bud and Terrence they can get their paycheck in his office. But when they go, they discover that the director's assistant, Sophia, has been taken in the back of a delivery truck, along with their money. After fighting their way back to the director, the player learns that someone named Tango was in charge of hiring everyone for the movie as a part of some scheme. But when the main actors didn't show up, Terrence and Bud got the parts instead. They're told that Tango will be personally handing out the prize at a dune buggy race, sending the pair off to acquire a vehicle with which to participate. Level four takes our heroes into an area inspired by the film Watch Out, We're Mad, in which they must acquire a dune buggy to enter into a race so they can confront Tango, but not before a beer and hot dog eating contest, just like in the movie. This plays out as a mini game where the player must time inputs to button prompts on the screen. As successful inputs are made, the prompts will speed up. If things ever get too fast, however, the player can take a drink of beer to slow things down. But they can't do this too much or they'll fail to keep pace with their opponent. Eat the most hot dogs within three minutes to complete the level. 
Level 5 continues the Watch Out We're Mad theme with the actual dune buggy race. In practice, the controls and isometric view make this challenge feel like RC Pro-Am and other games of that style. Of course, Oliver Onion's Dune Buggy from the film plays through this portion of the game, a song that's often been used as a sort of generic theme for the duo. Finish the race in the top three to make it onto the podium and finish the level. In Stage 6, Spencer and Hill must fight their way through the amusement park near the racetrack in pursuit of Tango. A fight on a bumper car track calls back to a memorable scene from the movie before the player is treated to the second proper boss battle of the game against a stilt walker. Bring him down to your level with a few well-placed slaps to complete the stage. The seventh level puts Terrence and Bud in Miami, the location of their two buddy cop films, Crime Busters from 1977 and Miami Super Cops from 1985. Making their way through city streets and across rooftops, the pair discovers the truck that took off with their money parked at a supermarket. Naturally, they punch and kick their way through the grocery store, encountering a fun new mechanic where you must have a produce throwing battle against enemies. Make it through this section and boss number three awaits in the stockroom. This is an interesting fight, as the boss doesn't have a traditional health bar, but instead a dollar amount. He sends a wave of henchmen your way, and as you take them out, he pays them money to stand up and keep fighting. Knock them down as he sets them up, and eventually he'll run out of cash, leaving him defenseless. Level 8 puts the duo behind the wheel of a very recognizable vehicle, the gold Lincoln Continental Mark III from their 1983 film, Go For It, which also takes place in Miami. Here, the player will take to the highway and chase down the truck containing Tango along with Sophia and their stolen money. Using a weak and strong horn to clear the way as well as a boost function, the Lincoln must keep up with the truck throughout the stage while contending with traffic, various obstacles, and henchmen on motorcycles. The ninth stage stands out as it employs more environmental puzzles than any other area, all of which involve pushing crates around or changing the direction of moving platforms. Here, Bud and Terrence must make their way through the city harbor in pursuit of their goal. More nods to go for it arise here as bad guys begin appearing with white shirts and pants and stockings over their faces. Our boys locate Tango on the dock where he has brought Sophia to his boss, Mr. K2, a character clearly fashioned after Buffy D's villain K1 from Go For It. Here, our boys board the ship and disguise themselves as crew members, deciding to allow Sophia to stay captured until they can locate her father, who's also been kidnapped. Stepping off the boat in level 10 puts our heroes into a pastiche of another one of their films, this time Who Finds a Friend Finds a Treasure from 1981. Running afoul of a gang of leather daddies led by a pirate biker recalls a similar plot point from the film and puts a fresh new obstacle in our boys' way. The pirate is the boss of this area, and in order to take him down, the player must destroy the platform that the gang leader occupies. Defeating him will save a village of natives who will show you how to get to K2's laboratory. Descending through a hatch into stage 11, Spencer and Hill must now sneak through the laboratory, dodging laser sensors and cameras, as well as contending with a new stealth mechanic in which they must hide behind crates to avoid being seen. Arriving at a security room, the pair overhears a conversation that reveals K2's plot. You see, K2 is the owner of a canned bean company who's developed a type of legume that is resistant to all disease. So he's kidnapped Sophia's father, a scientist, and is trying to force him to deploy a virus that will destroy the world's food crops, except, of course, for his beans. And if Sophia's father doesn't agree, K2 will launch her into space. A solid plan, if you ask me, but K2 didn't count on Bud Spencer and Terrence Hill crashing his party. Sophia's father finally gives in and starts to deploy the virus, but K2 starts the rocket launch sequence anyway and runs away. Bud and Terrence learn that the only way to stop the launch is with the remote control that K2 has. The boys follow the villain's trail and end up in a false bathroom that's actually an elevator back to the surface. Level 11 gives an early nod to the very recognizable Bush plane from the 1973 film All the Way Boys, before having the player navigate through the airport to K2's cargo plane, including an auto-scrolling segment across the airstrip. Before boarding the plane, you'll have to deal with a number of baddies on motorcycles, calling back one last time to a scene from Watch Out, We're Mad. After this, the guys jump on a couple of bikes and ride into the 12th and final stage. This area begins much like the train level, where the player must dodge obstacles while trying to catch up to the departing cargo plane. Once on board, you'll make your way through a brief wave of bad guys before facing off against the final bosses, K2 and Tango working together. 
Here, K2 will operate his H725 machine, aka the Beanator robot, which fires cans of beans at the player characters from the right side of the screen. Meanwhile, Tango fires on the duo with a rifle and is the main target of this first phase of the battle. Dodge the cans and then pick them up and throw them at Tango. Deplete his health bar this way and you can take on K2 and Tango in hand-to-hand -hand combat for the final phase of the fight. Once the villains are defeated, we learn that the plane is too far away from the island for the remote control to stop the rocket launch. Bud must now land the plane, but discovers that it's been damaged. Terrence lightens the load on the plane to keep them airborne and tries the remote control again with success. Bud crash lands into the ocean, where the partners then sit upon the wreckage waiting to be rescued as the credits begin to roll. If it isn't clear by now, Trinity Team took great pains to stuff this game to the gills with references and callbacks to the films of Bud Spencer and Terrence Hill. And not only audio-visual callbacks, but even lines of dialogue taken word for word from these 40 and 50 year old screenplays. There are even a couple of nods to movies not involving the duo at all, including Ghostbusters and Back to the Future Part 3. Helping to sell this niche nostalgia bomb is the soundtrack. Aforementioned tunes by Oliver Onions and Franco Michelizzi, as well as a couple of familiar songs by the Fantastic Oceans, make for a jaunty sonic backdrop for all the slapstick violence to play against. The cartoonish sound effects, some of which are lifted right out of the films, elevate each encounter to pitch-perfect levels of authenticity. And for those of you who would like to enjoy the classic music unblemished by other game sounds, a jukebox option is available from the main menu containing all music tracks from the game, even the few original tunes produced by Mushroom Sound. Graphically, this is a handsome visual homage to arcade brawlers from the 80s and 90s in its own right, but doesn't exactly nail the look of the Streets of Rage or Final Fights that it's aping. The smaller sprite size recalls something more in the vein of Double Dragon or Kunio Kun, but the playstyle does not follow that thread. Speaking of which, the mechanics are probably the weakest link in the whole production. Overall, they work serviceably, but there's nothing especially complicated or novel going on here, and therein lies the problem. Despite a number of interstitial minigames with unique playstyles, the whole thing feels fairly repetitive. And with no secrets to find or character upgrades to be had, there's not a ton of replayability here. But if you want to play through the game with different colored clothes, you can do that, I guess. Difficulty-wise, I found my medium setting playthrough to be an absolute breeze, and a quick test of hard mode after I finished the game didn't seem like it would be much more of a challenge. Part of the issue here is perhaps the hit detection on the Y-axis, which was a bit broad for my tastes, requiring a very small amount of positional accuracy to land blows against enemies. All that said, the attractive presentation, especially the dynamic level theming and upbeat music, made these few hours go by fairly quickly. All told, I had a really good time with this, and I'll never pass up an opportunity to recommend a game with local co-op, a feature that's seen less and less love over the years. The most remarkable thing about Bud Spencer and Terrence Hill Slaps and Beans is far and away the care and consideration taken by the developers to make something as true to the spirit of its source material as possible. And despite the duo's popularity in their heyday as years go by, it feels as though Mario Girodi and Cardo Petersoli's contribution to the Spaghetti Western has taken more and more of a backseat to the works of Sergio Leone and Clint Eastwood. So while I give the game a mild recommendation, I would really like to take this time to proselytize for the movies it was inspired by. What I love about the films of Terrence Hill and Bud Spencer is that they take the grit and grime of their contemporaries and transplant the violence and cynicism with optimism and heart, making for a uniquely lighter view of the American West and other exotic locales without the squeaky clean cheesiness of many mid-century adventure films. Their movies are often quite low-key and lazily paced, and with the camaraderie on display, make them feel like a sort of proto-hangout movie. It's a tone all its own, and if you can find friends in Bud and Terrence, you've truly found a treasure.